Well, hey, welcome everybody. Glad that you're, uh, you're here with us. If it's your first time in person or online, we're so glad that you've, uh, that you've stopped to check us uh, out. We would love to get to know you, answer any questions you have about Centerpoint. And the best way to do that is to text the word welcome from your phone to the number here on the screen. And just for doing that, we'll send you a Starbucks gift card. You can have a coffee uh, on us. And uh, just a little bit later in the service, after the message today, we're going to take communion together. So I hope you got a communion pack on your way in. If not, you can go back to the back table and grab uh, one of those. So if you are at home, you can just kind of take me into the kitchen with you right now. We'll travel. Uh, you can grab a cracker and some juice and uh, be ready to take communion with us uh, in a little bit. So how many of you are done with your Christmas shopping? Raise your hand. I see a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble in the room. I got good news for you. Good news for you. Uh, December 25th is not actually Jesus' birthday. Uh, so you've got, you've got just a little bit of time. I mean, there is a one in 365 chance that it is, but we don't have a birth certificate to, to verify it. So most scholars believe that he was probably born in the summer months because it's not likely that Rome would have required uh, the, the travel for the census during the winter uh, months. And so Christmas in July may very well be uh, a thing, but, this, but celebrating December 25th as the actual birthday is just tradition. Uh, that's all it is. And here's how it started. December 25th was actually a pagan holiday introduced by the Romans that concluded a week-long period of lawlessness. So for an entire week, December 18th to the 25th, uh, there were no laws, there were no rules, anything goes, stealing, uh, property damage, you name it, you could do whatever you want. Uh, and there would be no consequences for it. And at the beginning of the week, December 18th, Roman authorities chose an enemy of the Roman people, and they gave them the title Lord of the Misrule. It was kind of like their version of the Hunger Games. And they forced this person to do all kinds of things against their will. And at the end of the week, on December 25th, they sacrificed this person in order to destroy the forces of darkness, which is just really ironic. But as Christianity began to infiltrate the Roman Empire, large numbers of pagans actually became Jesus followers, and they decided that this practice needed to end and that December 25th needed to be reclaimed for Christ. And there was no better way to reclaim this day of evil than by setting it apart as the pinnacle of God's Goodness, that the birth of, of Jesus, the plan of redemption that God had set in, in, into motion, this was his plan to destroy the forces of darkness. And so December 25th became the official day to celebrate this pivotal event in human history. And so the fact is, December 25th is, is not biblical, it's just tradition. Just about like everything else we celebrate around Christmas, you know, you decorate a tree out of tradition, you wrap gifts out of uh, tradition, and traditions are great. We all have them. Traditions are those things that bring us uh, together to celebrate uh, together, and I know a lot of you are having to sideline traditions this year. Uh, some of you aren't going to get to celebrate uh, with family. You're not going to be traveling. I, I talked to a couple uh, last service, so normally their kids all come and converge on their house they have four kids. Their families all come and converge, and instead they're going to each, each of their kids' homes. So, you know, four different visits for Christmas. It's just kind of the way it is uh, this year. And so our, our, our traditions have been sidelined. But one tradition that remains uh, that hasn't changed is, is the tr tradition of singing Christmas music, right? Christmas music is like the MC Hammer of, of Christ, Christmas traditions, right? You can't touch this, okay? So even, even with masks on, we can still sing and, and celebrate. And so we're wrapping up a series today called Christmas Carols, where we, we've been exploring the message behind the music of some of our favorite Christmas songs. And the song we're talking about today is actually my all-time uh, favorite, and it's Oh Holy Night. This song gets me every time. December 25th may be fiction, but one fact remains that whatever day, whatever night, it was a holy uh, night. Christmas is not about celebrating a day. It's about celebrating a decision. We're celebrating a decision that God made, an intentional decision that God made to step into humanity at a designated point in history for the express purpose of becoming one of us so that he could save all of us. And the story behind O Holy Night is a perfect example of God coming uh, for all mankind. So in 1847, a local parish priest in a, a French village was preparing for the midnight mass 
coming up, the Christmas Eve service. And so he wanted to do something special, something a little different. And so he, he went to one of his friends who was a poet. His name is uh, uh, Placide Capot. I think that's how you say it. I'm probably butchering that uh, name. But he was a poet, and he asked him to write a poem for the service. And he was a little taken back, a little surprised at the request because he really wasn't a religious guy. He didn't attend church. And so a little background on him. At the age of eight, he had one of his hands amputated uh, due to an accident. And despite his disability, he went on to win awards as a writer and a journalist. Uh, Then he ended up following his, his father's footsteps as a wine merchant, a seller of wines, but he continued to dabble in writing and in poetry. And uh, so he, was, uh, he, he felt honored and privileged to be asked, uh, and he decided and, uh, to, to go ahead and, and do that for the Christmas Eve service. And he went to the Bible for inspiration, which is always a good place to go if you're going to write something about Jesus. Specifically, he went to Luke chapter 2 to read the story of the birth of uh, of Jesus. And the version he would have read was you know, something, like, something like this in French, of course, but this is our King James version, or, or at, you know, the other name for it is the Charlie Brown Christmas version the, of the Christmas story. And, and here's what it says. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea. Under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And as we talked about last week, this was a 90-mile trip on foot. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn a son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, the innkeeper always gets a bad rap as he's some you know, mean, ugly guy. I don't know that that's actually what happened. The reason that there wasn't any room was because so many people were traveling back to their hometowns. And so there was just a big crowd in Bethlehem, and there was no place uh, for them to check into. Uh, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now, it's one thing to be afraid, but when you're sore afraid, okay, I don't know what that means, but it sounds terrifying. So, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. This is the Christmas story, and this is the story that Placide Capot read, and on his way to Paris by stagecoach, he penned the words to O Holy Night. And he realized that it needed a little something extra. It needed some music behind it. And so he reached out to his his friend Adolf Adam, who was a musician, and he asked him to compose the music. Now, Adolf was a Jew. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, so he didn't celebrate He didn't celebrate Christmas. He didn't celebrate a man he didn't worship. But for whatever reason, he felt compelled to add a melody to his friend's poem. And three weeks later, on Christmas Eve, uh, this song debuted in a small church in an insignificant village in France. And from there, it grew in popularity until the Catholic Church discovered who wrote it and who composed it. And since neither of them were Christians, church leaders banned it from being sung in churches. And so O Holy Night almost faded into oblivion until about 10 years later when it was discovered by an American writer named John Sullivan Dwight. And he was involved in the effort to abolish slavery in the South. And he was inspired by the message of this song, particularly verse 3, which says this Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. And so he made this song famous in America, hoping that the message might lead to the end of slavery. Oh, holy 
night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. But the circumstances surrounding that night were ironically unholy. I mean, when, you, when you just think about the Christmas story and what took place, that, that they were relegated to a, a cave where the barn animals were kept. A manger, which is a really fancy word for a feeding trough. Where the cows ate hay. No fanfare, no parade, no distinguished guests of honor. And just around the corner of Bethlehem was the city of Jerusalem, which housed the temple, which was the center of Jewish worship. And, and there were five levels to the temple. There was the court of the Gentiles, uh, the court of Israel, the court of the men of Israel, um, the court of priests, and the holy of holies. And it was the holy of holies where the presence of God resided there with the Ark of the Covenant. And only one person was allowed to enter the holy of holies once a year. And that was the high priest. So one man, one time a year, could come into the presence of God. Nobody else could get to the presence of God. He was holy. He was off limits. And so this would, this would have seemed like a better place, a more fitting place. For the Messiah to be born, for the Son of God to enter into the world. But that's not what God the Father was aiming for. The events surrounding the birth of Jesus were intentional. God was sending a specific message. And the message comes from angels, not to priests, not to holy men, but to shepherds, to commoners. Shepherds weren't even allowed to get into any part of the temple because their job of handling sheep made them unclean, and so they were, they were unfit. And so this message comes to a group of men who were considered unholy. And then two years later, a group of non-Jewish men who practiced astrology and magic and various other types of religions, they travel upwards of a 1,000 miles uh, to visit this now toddler all right, and so if you've got wise men in your nativity, it's not actually you know, correct because the wise men weren't there on the night of his birth. They didn't come till like two years later, so you can take them out and just kind of put them in the kitchen, right? It's a good conversation starter. Like, why are the wise men there? Well, they're on their way. It's gonna be a while before they get there. By the time they get there, I mean, Jesus is in his terrible twos. He's probably in timeout, right? So just like your kids were uh, when they were, they were two. But the announcement in Luke 2 changed the game completely. The God who was off limits was now all-inclusive. That in, in one declaration, in one proclamation, the, the unholy invited uh, us into the presence of holiness. That the manger was a demonstration of God becoming accessible to humanity by putting on humanity, by wrapping himself in humanity. That the unholy couldn't get to the holy, so the holy came to the unholy. And Coupeau wrote, long lay the world in sin and error, pining till he appeared, and the soul felt its worth. I love that line. The soul felt its worth. We were lingering in sin. We were drowning in our mess. That's what pining means. It, it means declining in brokenness. And then Christ comes in the middle of that brokenness to show us our worth. I mean, have you ever felt like there's, there's no way God could love somebody like you? Is that ever, has that thought ever gone through your mind, like there, 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 there's no way that God's grace could reach me. I've done too much. I've, I've gone too far. Have you ever felt like you, you, know, you had to get yourself straightened out, like you had to clean up your junk before you could come to Jesus, before you could be worthy of God's love? I think so many people have felt that. So many people still feel that. And so if you've felt that, if you're experiencing that now, just soak in this verse for just a minute. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. God didn't wait until we could get it straightened out. He came in the middle of our pining. He came in the middle of our decline into brokenness. The fact that, that the God of the universe exchanged a throne for a feeding trough should speak to your value. It should speak to my value that Jesus spent 
his final three years on earth journeying toward a cross, that that's ultimately why he came. He was born so that he could die. He was born so that he could eventually take up a cross to die for the sins of the world. And as he's journeying to the cross in the, in the final three years, uh, he, he talked with people along the way. He engaged people along the way. He encountered people along the way to help them fill their worth. He befriended prostitutes. He ate with tax collectors. He touched lepers. He healed the lame. People who had no value in that society, in that culture, were made whole by Jesus because he deemed every soul worthy. Like the very fact that he came to earth should cause your soul to feel something, to feel worthy. Like you were worth a manger. You were worth God becoming flesh. You, you were worth a holy God putting on human skin. You, and you were worth that same God ultimately dying a sinner's death. Your soul will not feel its worth through accomplishments, as hard as you try. It will not feel its worth through achievements as hard as you try. It will not feel its worth through the approval of other people as hard as you try. It only feels its worth through the coming of a Savior. There is nothing that you can do to cause him to love you less and nothing you can do to make him love you more. He loves you just as you are and too much to leave you that way. So knowing there was nothing that we could do about our plight, nothing we could do about our pining, he came to us to do something about it himself. And so you were worth all the drama of Christmas. You were worth all the agony of the cross. He says the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. I mean, the world was weary when Jesus entered into it. The world was weary when Capot wrote these words. I'm so glad the world's not weary anymore, aren't you? And it's as weary as it's ever been. Growing wearier by the year because it's a, it's a broken world full of broken, weary people, but we can jo rejoice in the weariness because we're not hopeless. The thrill of hope is that the creator of the universe stepped into his creation to redeem us and to restore our value as children created in the image of God. The thrill of hope is that he, he breaks the chains of sin that keep us from living the life he created. And it's a hope for everybody, regardless of what you've done, regardless of how far you've gone. You, you, you're, you've never too far gone for God's grace. Right, and some of you, this, this is just the thing that you needed to hear today. Because you've believed otherwise. Like, I've, just, I've gone too far. I've done too much. There's no way God's grace could ever reach me. You, you're never too far gone for God's grace. It will meet you at your knees. And I think it's only fitting that one of the greatest Christmas songs of all time was inspired by a common parish priest in an insignificant French village written by a socialist agnostic poet and composed by a Jewish musician. And it's, it kind of sounds like a joke, right? A, a priest, a Jew, and an agnostic going to a bar, right? But this is God's grace. And this is the message of the angel in Luke 2. Like this was the tipping point of human history. That this was the good news of great joy that would be for all people, that God's grace was a gift for everybody, that he was calling all of us back into a relationship with him, like the birth of Jesus ushered in a new day, a new covenant, a new command, and a new way of relating with God. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. This is going to be a new day with a brand new commandment. And a brand new relationship. And so one night around 3 BC, the world tipped as God tiptoed into the world disguised by a baby to usher in a brand new movement and a brand new area. We were worth Jesus coming and we were worth Jesus giving his life. And here's the question that we have to ask. Is Jesus worth mine? Is Jesus worth my life? Is Jesus worth your life, and if so, it's time to fall on your knees. 
It's time to bow the knee to the king who made himself nothing so that we could have everything. And Paul said one day, one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We can do it voluntarily now or or it'll be mandatory later. But one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, Capot wrote it this way, sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raised, we let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Christ is the Lord. Jesus is king. Not just December 25th. Not just a nod this week because of, you know, it's something we all just kind of celebrate and go through. He he deserves more than that. He demands more than that. That as long as we have breath, that we should fall to our knees and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King. 114 years ago, this week, a man by the name of uh, Reginald Fezzedin made history. And he used a new type of generator where he he spoke into a microphone and he broadcast his voice over airwaves. Up to this point, the only thing heard over the airwaves was Morse code. But on Christmas Eve, 1906, the first words ever heard over the air were the words from Luke chapter that radio operators across the world were stunned as they were interrupted with these words, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And when he had finished reading Luke 2, he picked up his violin and he began playing the first song ever heard on the radio. O Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. 59 years after it made its debut in a Christmas Eve service in a small French town, it was now being circulated around the world through a new platform called radio. And we're still singing. We're still singing that song. We're still singing about that holy night. We're still celebrating that decision that God made that changed everything. And this is what I love about this, this story, that God loves using small, insignificant things to share his gospel of grace and his gospel of truth and his gospel of peace. I mean, Joseph and Mary... Who would have chosen them? Bethlehem, who would have picked that spot? A manger for the first bed? Who who, who would have made that, that decision? Shepherds? How how were they the first invites to witness the miracle? And a non-religious disabled man to write a poem about a Jesus he didn't necessarily believe in or worship or a Jewish man to write music about the Messiah that he was really still waiting on? I mean, only God does that. Because only God deserves the glory. I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Sometimes it's good to be foolish and weak and lowly because most of the time that's what God uses. So I wonder what he can do with you. I wonder what he can do with me because we are the foolish things. We are 
the weak things. We are the lowly things. But here's the good news of the gospel. Here's the message of the story. Here's the message of O Holy Night. We've been made worthy. We've been made worthy. And so we just have to be willing. And so this week, I just want to encourage you that you would take the time. Like you would not just, you know, rush through the Christmas season as hectic as it always is, but that you would take the time to sit and allow your soul to fill its worth. And then I want to encourage you to let somebody else know theirs. Somebody who is struggling right now with where they are in life, somebody who is struggling to to really believe if God loves them, somebody who is is struggling to know if, if God's grace actually can reach them, that you would sit with them and that you would let them know that they are worth a manger, that they are worth a cross. That is the essence of the Christmas story. That's the message of all.